Just before our love got lost, you said, I am as constant as a northern star. And I said, constantly in the darkness, where's that at? If you want me, I'll be in the bar. On the back of a cartoon coaster, in the blue TV screen light. I drew a map of Canada. a box of paints I'm frightened by the devil and I'm drawn to those ones that ain't afraid I remember that time you told me you said love is touching souls surely you touch my anchor are you forced out of me She knew your devils and your deeds, and she said, go to him, stay with him if you can, but be prepared to bleed. Oh, but you are in my blood, oh, my holy wine, you're so bitter, bitter and so sweet, oh, I could drink a case of you. All right, everybody. A little case of Joni Mitchell. Ah, oh, still playing. There we go. It is time. Time, I say. Time for Charlie Mossbrook to take over letting people in. <laughs> welcome, 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 everybody. I'm so, so happy to see all you lovelies joining us today um, for our regular feature here at farm virtual connections our weekly tuesday tech talk today's tech talk is um i think going to be extra special we have two speakers two of our beloved folk djs have given us um an hour of their time today which we're really really excited about and this is something that i have to credit sue kessel for because sue said you know what would be really helpful 
because artists are not the only ones in this time who are doing things from home or being forced to kind of learn new skills. And um, so I'm just super thrilled. All right. So before we get into that, let's take care of the usual business. Um, you are all muted and you will remain muted unless you would like to ask a question, in which case you will raise your hand. Um, the question and answer part comes at the second half of the show, so um, you can, but you can raise your hand at any time just to get in the queue, or you can enter your question in the chat. Uh, the chat is only to me, the hosts, or to one of our speakers. I prefer if you send them directly to me so we're not distracting the speakers while they're um, giving their presentation. And uh, we'll get to your questions in the order they are received. Um, what else can I tell you? Nothing. We're live streaming out on Facebook today as well as YouTube. I've finally connected Farm's YouTube channel out there. So if you're watching us on YouTube, uh, welcome. But this is something we should have been doing all along. I don't know why we don't. Um, and yeah, Charlie, I don't know if I'm forgetting something. I'm a little foggy today. But I am so excited to introduce to you our two speakers today. Rich Warren and Ron Alesco are both DJs that if you are in the folk music world, you know these names and you know who they are. And you've you've been listening to their radio shows and their uh, wonderful programming. And both of them are uh, have done some really innovative stuff and been involved in a lot of things in addition to live programming. Um, and Rich, even though he is now in his retirement and enjoying life out, off of the microphone, has agreed to spend some time with us today to talk about his process. And Ron has been carrying on um, in this virtual world for us. And so without further ado, I'm going to introduce first Rich. And then uh, after he's done, Ron will speak. And then we'll open up to questions. So... Are you ready, my friend? Hi, Rich Warren. You got to unmute yourself. Oh, look who just got here. I love the shirt. How's that sound? That's perfect. Excellent. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you. I'm not totally retired. I still host WFMT's Folk Stage, which is our live concert series, but I no longer have to produce it in my home studio. But what I'm here today to talk about is a home studio. Now, first of all, I went into radio because I've never been good in front of a camera. So you'll have to forgive uh, my camera presence today because I'm much more comfortable not looking into a lens. With that said, I'm also a bit of a dinosaur. I recorded the Midnight Special in this room from which I'm coming to you for 18 years. And it was long before COVID that I began recording in a home studio. And back in the day, in 2002, MP3s were just getting popular. Things were still largely analog with a lot of digital, but not like it became after the iPhone arrived. And I remained analog. When I started in radio, there were things called vacuum tubes inside the radio console, which created a nice warm feeling in the room because they were hot. Also, radio consoles had rotary knobs called potentiometers, or POTS for short. So doing crossfades required four hands because you couldn't just slide a bunch of faders up and down. You had to rotate two knobs at once and hope your pinky might reach a third knob. So radio and recording were very different back in 1968 when I began. And when WFMT told me I could record the midnight special at home, we actually bought a house based on the room I'm sitting in and on the large basement where there are 13,000 CDs behind me. I'm going to take you on a tour shortly if the cord on this camera reaches far enough. And it's a conceptual thing about how you record a radio program. Philosophically, I need to hear the music 
I'm playing when I talk about it, when I announce it. I don't want to record voice tracks and drop in the music. Even if I've recorded or listened to the song a dozen times, it's not the same as the immediacy of hearing the song when you open the microphone and say, that was, and you react to the music. On occasion, there's been just about tears in my voice. Sometimes there's a bit of a chuckle, uh, but I want to react to the music spontaneously and immediately, which is only possible if you, you can do it digitally, but it's much more complicated. Most digital recording requires some amount of computer dropping in what you want to play and then adding your voice tracks. You can listen, but it's not the same. So in this studio, I have this camera is right now sitting on top of a Mackie audio console. And to my right are two CD players. To my left is a broadcast quality turntable, uh, Technics SP15, with a high quality Hafler preamplifier attached to it. Uh, above my uh, console are two computer, large computer monitors. The left one contains the playlist and the commercials that I used to read on the Midnight Special. And the right one contains the recording software showing me how the recording is going and all that's necessary as far as what's happening in the recording process. And then above the two screens is a Focusrite compressor limiter so that my voice stays at the right level because it's not always possible to ride gain on yourself while you're doing everything else. I have it set for some very gentle settings so you don't hear it working. It also has a circuit that takes down uh, ambient noise so you don't hear my dog barking in the background, for example. And it makes for a nice cozy setting. And in the studio here with me are all of our comedy and show tunes and British Isles traditional LPs. And behind me are the comedy and show tunes that were part of the Midnight Special. Now you might ask, well, Rich, if you're retired from the Midnight Special, why are the recordings still in your home studio? Well, I had the prescience to realize that someday I would retire or a tornado would hit my house or something like that. And we loaded all the recordings in the library onto a network storage device, an NAS box. And that's what's sitting at WFMT, allowing the excellent Marilyn Ray Beyer to program the midnight special from WFMT. She does not do it from home. And these CDs will eventually go back to WFMT, but right now they're still in my basement. And we bought this entire house based on this basement and this room. This was the laundry room for the tenants who lived here previously. And they had moved the laundry upstairs to the first floor and left this room basically a kind of a home office. And I totally redid it. Uh, the space you record in is really important. A lot of people now during COVID have been forced to record in their closets. I hear NPR reporters like, oh, come into my closet uh, or their bathrooms or any place they can get quiet and privacy in their home. And also a little bit of claustrophobic. This room is wonderfully spacious. And I have two very high quality audio speakers, BNW 805s with a very fine amplifier so I can truly hear the music and enjoy it as I'm playing it, which I think is very important. Also, I've been using all these years a Neumann broadcast microphone, a condenser microphone that is uncommon in the US, but is the standard radio mic of most of Europe, unlike the RE20 in the US, which I've never liked the sound of. And I auditioned about a dozen microphones until I settled on this Neumann. And I've been very happy with it. The only weakness is it has, um, a click. If you if you hit a K sound too hard, it will register a sibilant. It doesn't register sibilants from S sounds or P sounds or B sounds, but a K sound will occasionally cause a sibilant in this microphone. But otherwise, it's an incredibly transparent microphone with no proximity effect. So it doesn't really matter how close or far I am from the microphone. So in this room, of course, it would be too live. I didn't want it to sound like a bathroom or Grand Central Station or whatever. So on all the walls surrounding the recording area, I have hung beautiful handmade quilts. And behind the quilts is fiberglass batting. 
So it makes the uh, room much deader sounding and not reverberant, just enough to make it sound live, but not too live. Because I think the sound of the room is very important to how you sound on the air or on a podcast. And I've heard one too many podcasts of late where the speakers are talking into their laptop and it sounds like they're 10 feet away. The sound is terrible. You owe your listeners, whether you're doing a radio broadcast or a podcast, to give them good sound. That is is so a a uh, non-brainer. I mean, it's like, why wouldn't you want to give your listener the best possible sound? You don't need an expensive German microphone. You can get by with a good $100 microphone. But for heaven's sakes, do it in a room that sounds good, where you don't sound like you're singing in the shower. It might be great for your vocal lessons, but really, if for radio or podcasts, make it sound like you're present, you're close to the listener, you're really talking into his or her ear and not from 10 feet away. So that's been very important to me. The advantage of having a broadcast turntable is that it immediately starts up, it has high torque, so I can cue up a record, hit it, and it rolls. Of course, the one thing I do digitally and have from the start is I record the program onto a computer, onto a hard drive. In the early days, hard drives are pretty slow. So I put a lot of memory in the computer and created a solid state hard drive so I could do edits very quickly because I was a whiz with razor blades. I probably, if I hadn't gotten the radio, I could have been a sushi chef because I could edit tape with a razor blade phenomenally well, but it took time and it was very wasteful because after you've made a lot of edits in the tape, you have to throw the tape away. You can't reuse it very easily. Digital editing editing is, is the way to go. And now, of course, with solid state hard drives and ultra fast computers, I can do digital edits in two or three seconds. So I did go back and edit the program because again, I thought that listeners deserved the best. And it's not a matter of vanity or uh, anything like that. It was a matter of just believing that listeners deserve to hear everything perfectly. And that was, uh, so digital recording. Now, of course, nowadays you don't need a PC or a Mac to do your recording. You can do it on your iPhone. You can do it on your iPad. There's any number of devices that you can do your recording onto and to a certain extent editing. Uh, So at one point I actually had a Studer A80 tape machine, an extremely expensive professional tape machine with Dolby A noise reduction adapters strapped to it. That was here for about 10 years. And then I realized after we converted all of the folk tapes to WFMT to CD, that the machine wasn't necessary anymore. So I sold it at a ridiculously low price to a local audiophile shop who uses it in his demo room to show people how great tape can sound. Um, But I really have no use for tape any longer. And also when you lay out your control room, of course, you want a certain degree of logistics. So you're not fumbling and reaching and and missing cues and things. So you can just reach over and know where the CD player is and hit play. And that's another issue today is that when I started doing this at home, there were probably half a dozen really good broadcast CD players available. And broadcast CD players have one notable feature is that they will auto pause that after the track plays, you don't have to program, they'll just stop, which is what you want, of course, because you don't want to have to worry about potting down the CD player in case you're doing something else. Uh, You can only buy one deck that I know of that's reliable, that sounds good and has this feature is the Tascam 500. They still make that, it's one of the few left available disadvantage of the Tascam 500 is it still uses numbered buttons to select tracks rather than a rotary knob, which all the earlier models use, which is much more convenient to, it's faster to use a rotary knob than to have to push buttons, especially after you get to track 10. But uh, that is going away. So you can't even buy a broadcast quality CD player any longer. And finally, I always recorded the program onto WAV files, which is a full file. That is, it's not compressed. It's a full fidelity file. Now, sending it to WFMT via the internet, when I started doing this, my internet connection was pretty slow. So we had actually Federal Express disks to WFMT from the studio here. I burned disks of the program, 
the FedEx guy would make a special pickup for me. In fact, he told me that if I wasn't done by the time his pickup was scheduled, I could bring the discs to his home and he would take them to the depot for me, which was a great honor. Uh, about two years into this, they increased the speed of my internet connection. And I was able to start sending files to WFMT. It took about half an hour for every hour of programming. We used something called FLAC, which was a lossless compression scheme. So it cut the file size by 50%, uh, whereas an MP3 can cut the file size by 90, 95%. The advantage of a full wave file is that you can manipulate it and convert it to MP3s later down the line without any loss that is from the original. Uh, the MP3, of course, will be a lossy file. But the problem, uh, if you send them an MP3, if you send your radio station or the podcast an MP3, and then they have to do something with it and convert it to a different speed or bandwidth or whatever, uh, you start losing quality. And I've always been a fanatic about quality. WFMT in the old days was so fanatical about quality. There was no other station in the country that had FM sound it won about a dozen awards for its FM broadcast quality. And even when I started doing this at home, I had to adhere to that philosophy of everything I sent in had to be the highest possible quality. I mean, this turntable is still using a Shure V15 Type 5 MR cartridge, for example, with an audio file preamp. Uh, we really cared about quality. It's not so much now because it's, people don't care as much about quality now, which is why MP3s rule the world. And I have no objection to that. Although when I listen to MP3s, I like the, the 320 uh, bandwidth because uh, that gives you the highest fidelity and the least compromise if you're using MP3s. So uh, that's one of the issues with MP3s is why when I was doing the show, the Midnight Special, I did not want to receive files from artists as MP3s because then I would have to convert them back to WAV files and then they would get converted back to MP3 somewhere down the line for our internet archive, and the quality deteriorates rapidly. So it's always good to start out with a WAV file or the comparable file on an, on an Apple computer, and then you can convert it to the final use as an MP3. But it's always great to start out with a WAV file because you're guaranteed the best possible quality. So those are some of my philosophical and uh, equipment uh, and now if you uh, buckle your seatbelts, this could get a little, uh, take your drama mean because uh, I don't have a steady cam here, but I'm going to show you some of the equipment that I've used over the years uh, for the program. For example, here we go. Um, see if I can show this. This is the uh, Panasonic SP15 turntable. And this is the uh, Focusrite compressor limiter. Now, Logitech does everything backwards with this, so it's really hard to figure out where I'm going. And then the two computer screens, which you can sort of see here. Let me, yep, you're getting dizzy. I know it's, uh, there we go. Um, you can't quite see what's on them, but one has the uh, sound file and the other has the playlist. That's the playlist for my final midnight special. Here is the, um, let's see if I can get this in the picture here, the microphone that I've been using all these years. The, really hard to do this with a little tiny inset on the computer screen to watch. There we go. There's the Neumann microphone. And here are the two CD players I'm, I was currently using. The top one is a Tascam I was talking about, and the bottom one is a Marantz. That sounds great, is easy to use, but does not auto stop after you play a track. So that's kind of frustrating. And then finally, this particular audio console is no longer made, but Mackie still makes, sorry for getting dizzy here. I'll try to get this, uh, there we go. Mackie makes a similar console with a digital output now, which makes it even easier to put in your computer. You don't need a uh, fancy uh, uh, A to D converter, but this Mackie console has served me well because it has uh, two, uh, four stereo high level inputs. And I don't know if you can hear me because I had the microphone turned to my back, but those high level inputs are for the CD players and the turntable, and then it has uh, several mic inputs, so I could have a guest in here if I wanted to, and of course, my mic. And uh, so it was a very versatile console. It has the minimal, it has some EQ positions, 
But other than that, it's it's a really simple console to operate, and I love it, and it's reliable. It hasn't ever gotten noisy or scratchy. It's it's just this thing will last forever, basically. It's been in service now for I think I upgraded to a newer Mackie console back in um, 2005, and this is so it's been about 15 years. This console has served me without a single problem. And of course, I have to manually mute the microphone, or the, rather, the uh, you know, the microphone, or uh, pardon me, the speakers when I am on the air. Because unlike a broadcast console, this does not automatically mute. That's the one thing you have to remember: is to mute your speakers when you turn on the mic, or you will get feedback. Um, just a little more of the tour here. Um, these are some of the recordings that are in my little studio. You can see that I've got a lot of great company here. And if I can look outside the door, um, you can vaguely see in the background lots of other CDs. Uh, but there's a room full of about 13,000 CDs in here. And uh, so, sorry for the... Uh, I, I should have hired a video company to professionally produce a tour and, and not gotten you a seasick on this. But anyway, that's that's my philosophy at home recording, but it's very cheap to set up basically. I mean, you can get, if you can still find a CD player, you can find cheap CD players. You can, these audio consoles are like $300, $400. Um, and I highly recommend them. You can do the same thing on an iPad, by the way. I mean, if you wanna go digital, Ryan will tell you all about that, but you can do the same thing on an iPad. Uh, I went first class, basically. Everything here except the console is from a radio station. And But if you want to do recordings at home, you can do it. Just remember to, to put something on the walls to deaden the sound a bit, to try to use some decent monitor speakers so you can really hear what's going on the air or on your podcast. And really don't economize on the microphone because that's what makes you sound like you sound. And... Why would you want a mic that makes you sound terrible? So choose a good microphone. Uh, there's so many companies that make great microphones these days. Uh, certainly, I think Sure makes some great mics. Uh, and all of WFMT's mics are ancient Sure microphones because they still sound good, SM81s with a big foam over them. Uh, they were never meant for broadcast announce mics. But you can also find uh, Audio Technica mics and you know, AKG and various other companies make fine mics uh, and, you know, try to choose the optimal recording distance between you and the mic, whether you need one of those, you know, big round screen pop filters or a foam filter or whatever, but it's really easy to do. Oh, and one other thing, if you're recording from home and you're using analog, now if you're recording to an iPad or an iPhone, it's not, or a laptop, it's not as critical because they run on batteries. But everything in this room has an uninterruptible power supply attached to it. So if the power flickers or even goes out for five minutes, the recording keeps going. You don't lose anything. This is really critical. You don't want to be in the middle of doing something really critical with your show and the power flickers and everything dies and you have to start over. The file doesn't get saved right or whatever. So I recommend spending some money on an uninterruptible power supply if you're using anything that's not battery powered, you know, if you're not using a laptop, uh, but a desktop PC and uh, an audio console, then run it off a UPS that at least cover you for five minutes because most glitches in the power company are, are shorter than that. So uh, that's something else to consider is always make sure you have a backup power. So I, I think I, I've covered everything as far as how I do it, why I do it. Uh, it served me well for a long time. And yes, I have the equipment. I could have gone completely digital, but you know, it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks and everything was going so well analog and I knew I was going to retire at some point. Uh, I still record a uh, folk stage using an analog console, though I could do it on an iPad. Uh, it's just as it's six of one half dozen of the other. It still goes into a uh, solid state recorder and uh, it goes back to the station. One last thing I'll mention uh, if you've got a spare $5,000 floating around, and I know most of you don't. <laughs> yeah, Sorry, laughing. Was I um, unmuted just now? <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> and that was, a bit, that was not an accident, Annie. Uh, there's a box called a tie line. And what it can do is it can take any reasonably good quality internet connection 
and send it back to your radio station or wherever you want it to go as a full fidelity file, as a full fidelity sound, so that you can do live broadcasts. When I do the WFMT Pledge Nights, which I'm still doing, I do it from this room with the tie line. The WFMT loans, loans me the tie line. I'm not wealthy enough to buy one myself, but uh, and uh, it sounds like I'm right at the radio station talking to Marilyn and, and George Preston in person because you can do that now with digital. And I'm sure the price of these things is going to come down, but it's an amazing box. And we do all our remotes now on the internet. And there, yes, are occasional hiccups because the internet was never made for live audio, high fidelity audio, but it's been working out for us. And I just want to mention that's a possibility. So whenever WFMT asks for something live from here, they simply UPS me the, the tie line. And I connect it to the same internet connection I'm using now. Of course, I recently, a year ago, received fiber internet, which is the most wonderful thing in the world. And so I get great results. But that's just one other thing to keep in mind. You probably could rent one if you needed it. So if somebody asks you to do a live broadcast and really great fidelity, full fidelity sound, it's it's an option nowadays. There are cheaper things you can use to accomplish that. They may not be quite as good. So I think I've covered everything, Annie. And um, I am so honored. I know you want to introduce them yourself, but I just want to say I'm so honored to yes. share this on Alesco. Because he is somebody I've admired a long time. I'm a regular listener to Folk Music Notebook. Uh, great programming, great sound, great ideas. And uh, so it's such an honor to share this forum with him. And he's going to tell you what a dinosaur I am and how easy it is to do everything. <laughs> and he's right. So, Annie, I'll let you take it back for a moment and introduce Ron. <laughs> uh, Rich, thank you. I'm sorry. I popped in, and I, now, now, obviously, I don't need to introduce Ron. Rich was the first person we reached out to when Sue suggested, well, Sue suggested Rich, and then Rich suggested Ron. And so Ooh, we've got- the mail. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but uh, let me just say thank you. Rich, honest to God, I took a whole page full of notes, and I'm not even a DJ. I think you've got, I mean, you rattled off some stuff where we could probably have a whole nother tech talk on that. So, and I'm sure there are some questions for you, and I will look forward to uh, asking them in a bit. But thank you so much. Don't go anywhere. You hang out in the back, and I'm going to take a minute to introduce Ron. Oh, yeah. Rich just did. <laughs> But actually, I did a really poor job of introducing Rich, but I just assume that everybody knows all you people. So um, I'm going to do a poor job of introducing Ron since Rich already did it. Thank you, Ron. Take it away, sir. Oh, thank you. Uh, I tell you, I, I am very jealous right now after seeing Rich's studio. Um, I'm, I'm going to do a little show and tell today. First of all, this is my library, a <laughs> Lacey drive. It's a four terabyte drive. And I'm able to transfer most of my, my audio onto that. Um, first of all, I just want to say what, what a pleasure it's uh, to be here. And, and it's, the feeling is so mutual with Rich. I mean, he is, he's taught me a lot over the years since we first met at uh, NERFA uh, a number of years back. And I am so honored that we were able to bring his shows onto Folk Music Notebook. And uh, yeah, retired isn't forever, so I'm, I'm going to keep pushing him. <laughs> anyway, um, we just flew first class with Rich. Now you're going to go tourist with me. Um, <laughs> you know, what, what Rich is showing us, uh, as he said, you know, some of it is not that expensive. A couple hundred dollars for a, for a decent mixer, a couple hundred dollars for a decent mic. Um, and I know a lot of us are volunteers and uh, money is tight. Um, the reason I started Folk Music Notebook was uh, an opportunity arose. Uh, the company I was working for decided to, to shut the doors. So... I, my wife and I sat down, looked at our finances, and realized I could do this dream that I've had for a while. Uh, but obviously, there's not a lot of money going around. So I do things kind of on the on the, the the down end. But quality, as Rich said, is so important. And there are ways that you can get a really decent quality sound um, and a and really well-edited show. You're going to have to make some compromises. Um, you know, what Rich was saying about doing it live, uh, I agree with him. But, you know, to me, I also, my background was in television. That was my day job in the tech of the department. I actually set up the, uh, the playback automation for CNBC in its original days. So I'm kind of familiar with these systems and, and I see a lot of advantages to it. 
Um, I actually got into editing my radio show well before COVID. Um, this probably goes back 20 years ago when, you know, I was getting tired of uh, going to the radio station to do an interview and then have to edit it, find studio time there. And with the di digital age that we were starting to advance to, I started seeing ways of doing it at home. And uh, one of the ways is a program that I use called Audacity, which I'm going to show you in a second. There are so many different ways to do it. There, I just want to say right off the bat, there's no one way to do anything. Um, there are a lot of different programs out there. There are programs where you can record your entire show uh, as Rich does, uh, live. And uh, the, what, the way I do it is a bit differently. Uh, I do the announce tracks separately from my recordings, and I get to mix it all together. Um, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you. I'm going to do a little screen share here, and this is. This should be working. You should hopefully see uh, the website that says Audacity. Uh, is that coming up? Did I do this correctly? We're just getting a section of it there, Ron. Oh, let me, uh, let me, whoops. Let me figure this out. Okay, this is the website. Um, Audacity is a multi-track editor. And it is free. So you can't beat that price. Um, it's a multi-track editor. There's different versions for Windows for the Mac, for Linux, and uh, other operating systems as well. And it's open source software. They continuously do updates. In fact, they just launched a new update last week, which I haven't really kicked the tires around yet. But uh, again, this is a free software, and it, it kind of reminds me a, a, a bit of the way um, other editing software works. So this is a website you should look at if you were... Uh, really interested but let me show you on mine now is this are you seeing my audacity screen or do i have to switch screens now i think yeah you're gonna have to shut stop sharing and reach oh, okay I know. <laughs> oh this new fangled technology i know <laughs> okay now let me open this up now this is going to be a little tricky to see but if it's a width this is my radio show from last week whoops uh, of course, when the camera's on, that's when I always get fumble fingers. Uh, but as you see here, this is multiple tracks. Each one of these is different interstitials, different songs. And I laid it out on a timeline here for three hours. And I can now move things around to produce my show how I see fit. I do this as if I was doing it live, meaning that I will start my introduction I will then pick my songs, uh, then I will go back and back announce, and I record it kind of as I'm doing it. However, um, if you're like me and just like to make changes, I often find myself re-recording things or saying, gee, I don't like the way that set worked out, and I start to redo things. So anyway, basically, I'll just play a little bit of this for you just to show you. This is the very beginning of my show. And it starts off with an ID. This is the Folk Music Notebook. You can tune in through your favorite listening devices. Download the Folk Music Notebook app at the Apple iTunes or Google Play stores. It's free. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Ronald Lesko. This is tradition. Okay, I don't have to play the whole show for you. <laughs> but I just wanted to show you, because you, you can see each of these are different files. Now, if you look at the very top, it says FM App ID 4. I basically just drag that from my hard drive onto the timeline. Over here, this is the Traditions theme song. And I also did the same thing. And over here, the, this part is Trad 1. That's how I did my announce. And what this system allows me to do is I can change fades. Uh, I can manipulate the audio file so that it's going to sound the way I want it to sound over the air. Um, 
again, unlike doing it live, you can work out your crossfades, you can move things around, and it becomes, in my mind, uh, a relatively easy way to make a very clean sounding show. Uh, unlike doing it live, you know, you can go back and fix things, and that, of course, is a drawback. If you're uh, like me, that you'll sometimes spend six hours doing a three-hour show. Um, but there are different ways that people can, can, can use this. You can even just use it as a simple recorder. Now, there's other software um, that's, that's out there that uh, I know a lot of people use. Um, I'm going to go to a different screen now, so let me stop the share. This is another website that I want to show you. I can get to it. Bear with me. Okay, this is a, a software that one of my DJs on Folk Music Notebook, Joe Pizanic, I'm sure some of you know him, um, he uses this software on his computer, Play It Live. And it's basically like uh, a glorified iTunes playlist. He can, fit, uh, he can put together a playlist of songs that he wants to play, he can go in and record and, and, and go live. Actually, he does live shows for our channel. And, uh, you know, it's very flexible. I personally have not used this system, but uh, he highly recommends it. There are much, there are many others, similar softwares out there. If you look DJ software, just do a Google search, you'll find hundreds of them. And a lot of them are, unfortunately, are, are meant for, um, club DJs who uh, do a lot of other things besides radio shows. But th to me, that, whoops, let me get back to this. To, to, oh, I'm sorry. Ah, fumble fingers here, I'm trying to work this. Where's my meeting controls? Here we go. No, I beg your pardon. Oh, here we go. I've lost my share. I'm trying to figure out Are how to... Yeah. Oh, here we go. There we go. Okay, good. <laughs> Sorry, folks. <laughs> I was uh, I rescue you, but you're doing fine. <laughs> see, this is why I like to record. When you do things live, <laughs> yeah. you end up with these mistakes. Uh, but anyway, um, it's, it's freeware. So to me, that is something that was a, a definite plus. Um, there are mixers that are not just physical mixers, but you can also get... Um, software that replicates the mixer. Um, microphones. Um, I use the Blue Snowball mic. This cost me 60 bucks. I mean, it's not, I admit it, it's not as anywhere near as good as, uh, you know, the Sennheiser mics and the, the Newman mics that Rich uses. But for me, I think it produces a good sound on the budget that I have. Uh, one thing that I do do that Rich was talking about Normally, I would have it set up. I bought myself a little um, uh, screen here. The microphone goes where my hand is. I put a windscreen over it, and that cuts out a lot of the background noise, and it, it, it gives it a much much clearer sound than what you're hearing now. I've kind of had it set up for a Zoom meeting. Um, but it's something that I, I've been able to do. I've been able to create files uh, for my radio show, which airs on WFDU as well as Folk Music Notebook. Um, I basically send them a file each week via uh, either Hightail or Dropbox, and um, they'll air it from their automation software that they use. Um, frankly, FDU has been shut down since the pandemic, uh, so many of our hosts have been working from home doing exactly what I'm doing with different versions of, of software. Uh, one of the nice things about Audacity is that it's got a lot of bells and whistles that you may or may not need. Um, it does have equalization. It does have different um, software that, that's added into it uh, that you could use to manipulate the sound so that it's going to sound as crisp and clear as you want it to sound on the air. Um, you know, Rich was saying earlier that, you know, people's ears have changed basically over the years and they're, they're not accepting or they're accepting MP3 files. And it's true. I mean, you know, I think our our technology has certainly changed the way people listen and access music. Uh, in some ways, I think it's good because we are able to get the music out to more people. Um, you know, I'm able to sit here in my den and record radio shows and operate a network, which is done a channel that's on, done on a, a whole completely different system. Um, 
but you can put things together like this on a much lower budget. Um, yes, you do have to be careful about what you're going to sound like because you want to you know, make it sound as good as you can for, the, for your listeners. Uh, there is some work involved, you know, getting files and transferring CDs so that you can store it on a hard drive. Um, and I keep it on an external hard drive as well as back it up in the cloud. I learned the hard way when I had a computer crash that uh, lost a lot of my recordings that I really need to do that. Uh, for some folks, this is just some, you know, an emergency. You're not able to get to your sta station. Uh, as I said before, I had been doing this for a while, recording interviews that I would then play on my show when I went to the studio on Sunday afternoons. I would also mix sets of music so I could have a full set all ready to roll. And I brought it in on a thumb drive, stuck it into the station's uh, uh, CD player, which had a thumb drive uh, connection. And I was able to do a lot of my show that way. And I thought I had a little more control over making sure that I made a good seg from one song to another. And then I played the correct segs. How many of us have uh, hit the wrong button and played the wrong song live on the air? Uh, doing things to try to eliminate that. So there are advantages, uh, but it is a, a big mindset to change over to a, to a digital. Um, you know, I don't have the space to store as many CDs. I have, can't really see it, it's off camera, but I do have a couple of shelves here in the den. I have shelves in my garage, in my basement, and it just got to the point where my wife said it's either me or the CDs, and that's when digital... Let me rethink this. No, that's when the, the digital really became uh, uh, a necessity because it's, uh, and I find it, frankly, I can search for songs uh, very quickly, much faster than I can finding the physical disc. Um, but again, it's also training yourself for that uh, different way of operating. And I've been doing my radio show, my folk show since 1980. I've been involved with the radio station since 75. And certainly there's been some great changes in technology, you know, which we're saying before about uh, the old potentiometers and faders. We had a, a, when I first started the radio station, we had a board, a control room board that was given to us by the BBC when they had a New York office. It was from the 1950s and it was still operational in the 70s. Uh, it worked, but it was a real clunky old thing. And over the years, the station has certainly improved. Uh, it's you know now more state of the art, um, able to do digital, and you know this isn't for everybody. Uh, it does take some learning to sit down. I mean, I'm, today we really can't do a full uh, session to to learn how to do a, an edit, but I just wanted to kind of give you all a taste for how this thing works. Um, it's not something to be afraid of. I, I find it kind of fun actually. Um, sitting there and having the time, which I happen to have, to put together a show and, and piece things together a little more quickly than I could on the radio when we're doing something live and trying to figure out what's the next song I wanted to play and running around the studio trying to find the CD. Uh, so there are advantages to it. There are disadvantages. Uh, there are some concessions you have to make uh, to sound. Um, but overall, as Rich was saying earlier, a 320 kilobyte file. I recorded constant bitrate because some automation systems have issues with variable bitrate. You can get a very good quality file on MP3 that, unless you're an audiophile, you know you're probably not going to recognize the difference on the on the broadcast. But it's the time you put into it, uh, the time it takes you to uh, to learn the system and the, the care you take. One other thing about uh, Audacity, which I just showed you, it can use all kinds of files. You can use uncompressed WAV files, uh, AIFF files, MP3s, uh, pretty much anything that's out there uh, it will work with. So I find it to be a very good system and uh, I you know, welcome anybody that if you're looking to uh, have some questions, you know, I'll be happy to answer, help you. There's wonderful YouTube videos on it. They have a good website and uh, it's free that's the best thing so in a nutshell that's it I'm working off of a laptop uh, I don't have a lot of fancy CD players just a little one a disk drive that I use to uh, rip songs from store everything on that hard drive I showed you and uh, it's rock and roll or folk and roll whatever you want to call it <laughs> so that that's pretty much it for me um, welcome uh, to the digital age <laughs> nice um, 
Am I still muted? No. Yeah, I'm not. I'm rich. Let's bring you back in the picture. Thanks, Bron. I'm, um, uh, I actually wrote down a question because there was something with your, um, when you do the show, you've got both traditions at WFDU, right? And then your Folk Music Notebook podcast, right? Well, Folk Music right. Notebook is actually a 24-7 internet channel. Ah, uh, um, right. so it, you're it, running other shows on that. Right, right. In fact, we run Folk Stage, Midnight Special, uh, gotcha. a number of other shows. Uh, but the broadcast primarily is uh, a playlist, a database that I have over I think it's close to 2,000 different songs at oh. the moment. Uh, and I build playlists through that, and it airs 24-7. Wow. Well, I should have, I mean, I should have known that. Folkmusicnotebook.com. Getting it right here. <laughs> it's I'm great. Not... We have free apps <laughs> for iOS, Android, and uh, Amazon Alexa. <laughs> Dropping it in the chat as we speak. All right. Now, um, ladies and gentlemen, I realized that in my nervousness about these two speakers kept me from telling you something very important, which was in the beginning, if you are unfamiliar with the raise hand feature in Zoom, this is how when I said raise your hand, I didn't mean physically because I can't see you. So what I need you to do is look down in, if you've updated Zoom recently, which I hope you have, you'll find it in the reactions tab at the bottom of your screen. There's a big old bar under there that says raise hand. So if you'd like to have, a, if you have a question for either of these gentlemen or a comment, please feel free to put that in there. Uh, we've got a couple of questions from the gallery already. So um, you don't need- Amy, Can I just uh, say a couple of things about Ron's uh, presentation? Of course. Well, first of all, I have to concur 100% about Audacity. It's the best value that, that you could ever find. However, if you want to go into the next level, WFMT's uh, software is Adobe Audition, which is ridiculously expensive and not worth it. But uh, because they used to be able to buy the program, now you have to subscribe to it like everything else from Adobe. But it's incredibly powerful. It can do anything. It's and I, I don't use it that much. I prefer SoundForge, which is simpler, mm -hmm. uh, but also at least you can buy it. And I use an ancient program called Software Audio Workshop, mainly because it's the closest digital program to using a razor blade. It allows you to basically razor blade files. Uh, you don't, it's a whole different mindset of editing, but I came from a razor blade, so that's what I use. By the way, if, if you notice that I've been looking up, it's not because I'm asking for God's help. It's because the uh, monitor for the uh, Zoom session is above my limiter here, and I have to look up to see all of you. So it's not because I'm looking away from the camera. It's just I can't do both at the same time. So thanks, Annie. No problem. And I'm looking down on you guys right now. So just so you know, my camera's up here. <laughs> um, all right, great. All right, listen. One, one little thing that I just want to add, you know, Rich was saying about the razor blade. I, I found with, uh, with Audacity, I can get in there and make cuts, you know, to the millisecond. So it, it works fairly well as well, uh, especially for the price. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I agree. All right. So first question up is for Rich. Um, these came in while you were talking, Rich. And Paul has got his hand up. So, but Paul, you had several questions. So if I'm asking your question, in fact, let's just unmute you and you can ask them all. Do you want me to do it or no? Me. Okay. So, he, uh, what, you mentioned a network storage. What is your network storage that you've got, Rich? It's a box full of hard drives, which has the basis of a, a very primitive computer inside of it that allows you to access audio files or it could be anything else. It's called network attached storage. And you can daisy chain these boxes if you want so that everything you own can be in one of these boxes. They start at about $500 and go up to about 2500 depending on how much storage and how much flexibility you want. But it allows you to um, plug it into your PC or it'll work with a, with a Mac and have much better access than simply uh, putting out a hard drive. It, it gives you much more ultimate storage capacity. And I think the, the uh, box that WFMT has that I loaded this library into is 12 terabytes. And it also has redundancy. So if one of the drives fails, there's a backup drive already within the box that backs up the, the uh, each drive. So there's actually you know like six drives or eight drives in this box. So not only does it have a huge capacity, but if any drive fails, it has a backup. 
And so if you're doing mission critical radio work, that's kind of nice to have. Uh, it's not as convenient as having, you know, the CDs at hand. But um, one thing I didn't mention, by the way, is I just love the fact to touch and feel and open a CD and see the beautiful artwork and the incredible graphics design. There's some woman in Michigan does incredible graphics design uh, for these CDs. And uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a feeling that's a little different than doing everything digitally. But that's my hang up. Uh, that's the answer to the question about NAS. A network attached storage and there's two or three brands that specialize in it okay cool that sounds yeah two terabytes 12 terabytes wow um and uh matthew i think i, I you asked your question again down here what brand of nas is that what network attached storage is, yeah, is I, you know i i'm spacing out on it should be on the computer here and i can't remember is synology what, synology does that yeah that's the well, that's the one yep there's two or three brands, but that's so I think that's the one we're using. Okay, great. That is your um okay. And Paul, did you wanna go ahead and you had another question. I'm gonna let you yeah. ask. Yeah, I basically uh Rich just answered the question. This may be above and beyond what anybody can do. It just happens that when we built the addition on the house, this is what my office is in now. And just should it ever happen. I asked somebody at Q Studios here in Falls Church, the room here, it's double uh, double uh, drywall, plus it's an internal room, but it's double drywall and fiberglass. So even though it's in, so, and this room is, uh, it just keeps the sound really down here. Just want to yeah, throw that out because that's, I had, I had to learn that before we built this room. So we'll leave it at that. Yeah, this room also is double drywall. And in fact, all of the computers, and I, there's a lot of computers involved in my show when I was doing it, they're all up in the second floor office and I had special data wiring installed and audio wiring. The walls in my house have this huge conduit that goes up to the second floor office where all the equipment is. So it's dead silent down here. You don't hear any computers because they're all upstairs. So yeah, and it's all double drywall and it's all concrete behind the drywall except for the furnaces, you can't hear the furnace because of all the double drywall. So uh, it works out quite well. Double drywall, I don't know what that is. Wanda, um, I'm gonna call on you next. So I'm adding you into the spotlight. Did you get uh, your uh, request to unmute? You can. Okay, um, Ron, you are plugging your microphone and your Lacey, um, your Lacey, uh, um, library directly into your laptop? Yes. Um, so they're USB connected? They are USB, right. And um, so when you have the Lacey um, library in there, do you have more than one monitor so that you can see the song coming up and then um, download it into the Audacity? Well, no, because I'm I'm pulling from the hard drive into my Audacity program. I'm not really playing as a as a playlist, uh, not with the soft, not the way I put my show together. Uh, so it's not like I'm doing a live. You know, I'm not sitting there while the song is playing. I, I'll just dra drag and drop the song into the playlist. I'll drag and drop the next song. I'll fix the uh, the cue points for each. Then I'll keep moving on that way and building my show. But you don't actually see the song um, in the in the uh, it, you don't have a second monitor where you see the song come up and then you drag and drop or did it, it come down in the same monitor? It, well, it's in the same monitor. I'll, I'll like, for instance, I'll sometimes use my iTunes um, as a way of looking at my library. So if I can see, OK, what song I'll just call up and do a search in iTunes because it, it's also looking at my my uh, Lacey drive. Uh, okay. where my music library is and i'll see oh there's bob dylan's blowing in the wind so i'll take it from itunes and drag it right into audacity okay and it's right, right thank there. you nice thanks wanda all right let's see um i'm gonna go to a, a gallery question right here ron what format or f i think it might be of file organizing application or maybe or file organizing application you use on your hard drive to keep track of albums slash songs um, right now primarily itunes i know it's not the best program out there but uh 
for a number of reasons, I, I've been able to, to use that to, to categorize all, all of my songs. I can search by a, by a number of different fields. So that's kind of my, my database, so to speak. Uh, I have looked at a few others, but I haven't pulled the trigger and, and, and went for anything other than that. And again, iTunes, the price was right, too. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> iTunes. I'm worked. cheap. I'm cheap. Well, let's, let's, I'll admit it. <laughs> hey, I love it. I like that's You know, it's great. Hi, Ray. How you doing? Good question. Sir. I should have a comment, if that's okay. Sure. Um, I use a, a free software program called a Virtual DJ. It's, it's, and it's mostly, mostly for, like, club and weddings. So I only use a, a few of the... Um, Features which basically are, I can put my playlist up there, I can cue my songs, and of course the microphone, and I, I do it uh, in real time. Of course, I do edit it to take out stupid comments and uh, things that I might say. Um, I have an interview every week, and I uh, the radio station has a StreamYard account, so I can record it. Um, the thing I like about StreamYard is um, there's no software to download for the other for anybody uh, and also you don't have to put the time and day when you want to do it so there's no schedule you just use it when you want to use it so um, th it's worked pretty well for me virtual DJ cool well um, Ray if you think of it drop that link in the chat for me and I'll share it with everybody yeah. okay I Ray, you, just, you just reminded me of something else um, there's and, and Rich you said something earlier about ISDN lines. There's a website called IPDTL.com. It's sort of like Zoom on steroids. It's an ISDN replacement um, group, uh, and basically it works kind of like Zoom. You know, you basically can use phone calls or ISDN audio calls. Uh, a couple of our shows are actually using it. It's, it is like a fourteen dollar a month service. Uh, but the quality is exceptional. Um, I know folks seen uh, the Alan Larman show that he took over from his parents, Roz and Howard. Um, he uses it, and it's just brilliant audio. Um, you know, well, same it thing. Must simulate to... ISDN because the phone companies aren't supporting ISDN any right. longer. Right. Yeah. Exactly. They they have software that you know both parties have to download, but it just sounds incredibly uh, incredibly clear. He's even done music with it, which. I was very fascinated with. Wow. Um, okay, uh, Matthew, I see your follow up for Ron, but we're gonna um, we're gonna take uh, Ron Lewis's question first, and then hi, Ron, how are you? Hi. Um, quick question for either one or both of you guys. Um, I've been recording our WNUR shows at home using Adobe Audition, but you know it's like Audacity, same kind of thing. I'm trying to figure out what the ideal volume level should be in terms of like minus three dB, minus six dB to not be too hot, but not be too soft. And do you try to have your audio, tr your voice tracking run the, at the same level as the music and how you kind of manipulate that to get it to sound right? Well, what I do, I, I've kind of used a rule of thumb about minus 10 dB. Uh, and again, if I can just do another quick screen share, I'll go back to Audacity for a second. Um, yeah, like, I don't know if you can see this, but basically I can control the levels in a number of different ways. I can drop it a few dBs, uh, however I wish, by, by doing this little slide fader here. I can also pull down the entire file and bring it down if I want to mix something in under it. So, but I, I usually use rule of thumb minus 10. Okay. I, I generally use minus six, but uh, as, as uh, Ron said, uh, I, uh, I go back after I record the show and digitally smooth things out a bit. If things are not the right levels, my voice is too loud in a place or the music is too loud. Some artists record their CDs at as high a level as they can get onto the CD hmm. and other artists don't. And even though I adjust it manually, because this is this is analog, uh, I don't always get it right. So I go back and, and make a little digital tweaks because in the digital domain, it, you don't hear that. It's not unnatural. It doesn't add distortion. That's audible. So uh, that's the beauty of using Audacity or any audition or any of those programs is you can adjust your levels after the fact if you're not doing it live. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Is it great. Thanks, Ron. That's interesting. You know, something that... Um, I think it was what Ray said 
I don't know. But you guys both uh, mentioned, Rich, you were talking about real time, um, that you liked to react real time to the songs and that you were, so you're listening. And even though you're recording your show, you're doing this all real time and live as if you would in the studio. And I was really taken with that idea. And um, uh, do you pre-plan your segues? Uh, as well and in recording this question is for both of you because you do it differently like are you scripting are you just sort of so good at this that you're off the cuff all the time <laughs> rich you first <laughs> don't give away any trade secrets or anything but <laughs> when i did the midnight special uh, i spent eight hours playing the program Three hour show. I spent eight hours choosing every single song and, and bit of music and comedy that went into the show and sequencing them. So the whole show was one woven fabric. However, I never ever scripted what I said. I would immediately respond to the music. And if something came to mind while I was talking, I would say it. Um, but certainly you could hear when I was reclumped, when, when a particular song played. Or if something tickled my fancy, I would come on with kind of a, a grin in my voice. And so the, the commentary, the continuity was never scripted except for the commercials and the promos and things. But, uh, but the music was always pre-planned. And I also had to make sure it fit within the right amount of time. So a lot of editing at the end, trying to take stuff out. And I deliberately ended, I had a closing theme, which had 48 seconds of applause at the end. So it gave me a, a, a cushion so that I could cut out or extend the applause to make the show the right length. Now, <laughs> Marilyn's a lot more professional and she gets it right to start with, but I never was able to do that. So uh, I always fudged with the uh, closing applause of the, the closing theme, but uh, I, I, I could not do a show improvised. I always had to have it planned. Nice, yeah. Can we, oh, by the way, can uh, you share that applause? Uh, recording with us uh, virtual oh, well it was it was the um kim and reggie harris and magpie recording of phil oaks's song when i'm gone and yeah. it deserved to have 48 seconds of applause at the end because it was so powerful gotcha. and uh also uh greg artsner at some point during the applause would say thank you very much and i always made sure that stayed in because that was my <laughs> secret word to the listener thank you very much nice. and i appreciate their being there and so the applause never faded till after he said that. Nice. Um, nice. Good. All right. Ron, how about you? Well, I, I, I plan everything out and I, I don't write a script, uh, but I do a lot of retakes if I didn't like the way things came out. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll know what my set I had just played and what I'm planning to go to so I can some, sound somewhat coherent. But if I mumble or something comes out wrong, I'll go back and fix it so I sound like I know what I'm doing. Who's that? That's <laughs> my cat. The cat shows up. Yeah, he's <laughs> trying to get on the show. It's kind of like the Lucy show. <laughs> nice. Well, I think that's the benefit of this whole digital world now. You know, I mean, you, like if you were in the studio and doing it all real time and live in the, you know, the old school way, right? All mm -hmm. your mumbles and fumbles would be part of the show. And, right? you know, there, there, there's some charm to that. You know, I think people enjoy hearing us screw up on the air. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, I don't know. I, to me, I, I feel like since I started, especially the last year, doing this on a more frequent basis, uh, I feel I've made my shows tighter. I think my, my playlists are more concise. I mean, there's been a lot of times I'll be at the radio station. It's the last 20 minutes. I go, what the hell am I going to play now? Uh, I played everything I wanted to play or, oh my gosh, I didn't get to this. You know, so this gives us a little more opportunity to, to plan out a smoother show, I think. Yeah. I want to share a little secret. Um, my two predecessors, who were both incredible people, radio broadcasters, uh, were the opposites. Norm Pellegrini, his shows were flawless, absolutely flawless. And most of the time he did it without any editing. He was just that professional. But Ray Nordstrand, who I understudied, was people loved Ray because he made so many mistakes, because there were huge pauses, because he kind of bumbled his way along. We used to rebroadcast the midnight special on Wednesday afternoon. It was live Saturday night. And Ray always did it live. Norm pre recorded his show, but Ray always did it live. And after Ray's show, my first job at WFMT when I came, Ray would hand me the, the, the big 10 and a half inch reels and said, uh, Richard, uh, make me sound good for Wednesday. <laughs> um, 
And I would go back and edit out all his mistakes and pauses. And that's how I earned my keep at WFMT for the, the first few years. Nice. <laughs> You know, one little thing I like to do when I'm before I put the mic on to record, I make sure I listen to the last 30 seconds or so of the song so I get the, the mood of that song. I don't want to come up sounding all bubbly after I just played a death ballad or something. Like right. that, you know? <laughs> nice. Good. Good plan. All right. We've got another question. Jack. Hi. Jack. Oh, hi. Can you, can, you, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Hey, John. Good. Hey, Ron. Yeah. So I, I, I'm actually in the car. I'm on the road. I'm not driving. Um, uh, comments more than any questions, really. I'm not, I, I came in in the middle of Ron's presentation, so I'm not sure what you guys have actually covered. But um, my experience in this is uh, kind of twofold. I, I, have a, I have a jug band show on Folk Music Notebook, uh, which is pre-recorded using audacity but it's done live the only the only thing i plan is is with my other show too i have a script for the intro and that's really all i use uh just to make sure i say everything i'm supposed to say before the actual show begins i use um a dj software called radio logic right uh which i was introduced to at wfdu i have a, i have a show on wfdu as well but it's a rock and roll show. Um, and that interfaces with iTunes. So I have a kind of a vintage um, uh, MacBook Pro. My entire library, both rock and roll and uh, jug band music is on that hard drive, which is backed up regularly. And that interfaces with this radio logic. So I can, I can design a playlist in, in uh, iTunes and import it into Radio Logic. And when I when I put together a show before I before I actually do the show, I put together a show that's got way more material than I'll need, and that this gives me the absolute flexibility uh, to move things around. You know, as depending on how things go. Um, you know, I get inspiration like everybody else does from various places. I'm playing one song and. It, reminds me of something else i can instantly even if it's not in my my original playlist i can instantly pull it out of the database and queue it up for the next song um i use uh i think i have four different kind of theme sets that i use periodically um for the jug band show which is called sound so sweet every other monday night 9 to 11 p.m eastern time um and I, you know, I, I, I have, I have a set called coulda, shoulda, woulda. And I, I use that as an excuse to play some, some kind of old rock and roll stuff. Meaning this could have been a jug band show, should have been, a, it would have been a jug band show if only they had sense to stick a jug in the mix. <laughs> and, and, and all of that stuff is actually doable. In my experience as a jug band musician, we have done plenty of that old rock and roll stuff, jug band style. Nice. Um, nice. I, I seldom nice. edit any of that stuff, and I just export everything to Ron, and he puts it up. Nice. Well, I, I love, yeah, I mean, I think there's merits to off the cuff, too. Thank you, Jack. And sure. drive safe out there, sir. <laughs> all right, I'm you parked. Can... I'm parked. I'm parked. All right. All right. <laughs> Um, so here's the deal. Tom, I see your hand up. And at the moment, I'm going to fish through and make sure I didn't miss any questions that have already been asked. Our usual MO is an hour, but when we have a lively conversation, we'll go up to 3.15 um, or 2.15 for you in the central time zone or elsewhere. Um, uh, so if you have any like pressing questions that didn't get answered, please uh, speak now. And uh, maybe if our speakers don't mind hanging out for a little bit longer, we'll go ahead and we, we don't run a very tight ship here. So well, I, have to, I have to run in a few minutes because my partner has a very critical Zoom meeting for her job and she's oh. taking care of. So. OK, gotcha. All right. Well, that answered that question. So why don't we make Tom the last question? Go ahead, sir. You can unmute yourself. We'll see if we can make this Hello. quick. Uh, Hello, hi. Good to, good to see you all. It, it's great. Rich especially missed you at the Folk Alliance 
online. Uh, more of a comment than anything else. Um, currently, we're using Zoom for our live broadcasts right now, especially during the fundraiser. I just pre uh, to to the station all of the, the the music that that I want to throw to, and I do follow a script throughout that whole thing. So uh, Zoom has uh, over has really replaced the ISDN lines or the, uh, I think they used to call them T4 lines at one time here. Uh, I used to be in telecommunications for a while. So I know a little bit about that. So Zoom has worked very effectively on a lot of areas. Plus my internet here is pretty good. Um, guys, I, I was really looking for some insight how to shorten how much time I spend. So I spend about six hours for a total production of a two hour program. Mm -hmm. Now the station, uh, I'm contracted to do it, of course, but the station um, tells me I have to do various things to upload, download, format, and a lot of the stuff, not only in pre-production with scripts, is done in post-production. So I, I, I say I edit out the stupidity a lot of the times, you know, instead of saying 1974, I might say 1964. And the folk music listeners will catch that. And I found that out on a regular basis. Um, I've tried to go wholly digital, uh, Ron, uploading, downloading, and things like that. Uh, but now more and more, I've simply gone back to uh, as live an event as possible, because like Rich was saying there, um, I want to interact with the music. And if I hear a mandolin break in the middle, then, then I want to throw to that or join it all together. And uh, I'm very, very fortunate in that. I'm a big collector of music. So I have a, a large vinyl library, very large vinyl library and an exceedingly overbearing large uh, CD library as well. So I tend to go to that for, for the tactile function of that. And I still feel it's important to stay there. So, so I, I wanted to become um, more technically savvy through this, but I think I'm going to forever be a dinosaur when it comes to putting these programs together. And I'm still looking for a way to, to, uh, to make it easier. But uh, a lot of the comments here, including some software ideas, my, I still have a very old Microsoft uh, software-based uh, Steinberg Wave Lab, which was about $300 about 10 years ago. And I still use that and definitely afraid to change to anything else, although I've downloaded Audacity. So. That's all, just the comments. Good to see you all. Uh, thanks, Tom. Thank you, thank you. Um, all right, so um, here we are at the end of our really awesome talk. There is a, There were a couple of little questions, so um, what I'd like to do is give Rich a chance to graciously bow out if he needs to. There's a couple of questions that Ron could follow up with if, he, if you want to stick around for a quick sure. second after that. So we can all take a moment to thank Rich so much for your time today. Honestly, sir, always a wealth of information and so generous of you to share this with us. And I promise not to share that private little email you shared with us i've lost it already i'm just kidding if people want to reach you um should they just you know scream out rich's name loudly in the no <laughs> well they can find me at uh, folkstage at volo v-o-l-o dot net so it's folkstage at volo dot net and it was a great honor to be a part of this and i'd like to thank you annie for inviting me and i'm hoping that we'll all see each other in person, even if we have to be masked sooner rather than later. So uh, may you all get the vaccine and have a great radio show. Thank you, Rich. Thanks, and don't Rich. forget, we've got a, a folk DJ peer session in um, coming up next month. I hope you can make it. Thanks, Rich. <laughs> all right, guys, um, we're going to wind this down with this real quick. So, OK. Um, uh, sorry, I got to get back to the question. It was with regard, it was a follow-up on your iTunes. Do you organize your music like around playlists or tag your songs with keywords at all? This is Matthew asking this question. Well, with, with iTunes, I don't. I just put in the, the song, the name, the title. And you know, basically, as I would be doing a live radio show, I mean, I just have to rely on my memory. Uh, or, you know, with iTunes, I can look up, okay, I want. I need a train song right now. I'll mm -hmm. type in train and a bunch of songs will come up or just certain key words that might spark. Um, the difference with Folk Music Notebook, 
is I do have tags that way, um, the way that he's referring to. So I can, you know, put songs together by different genres or, you know, fast tempo, slow tempo, and, and I can build playlists kind of generically that way. But with iTunes, no, I, I just kind of used it as a, as a tool just to find songs. Nice. Okay, cool. And the last question is from Bruce Swan. Ron, are you recording to Audacity? Yeah. Well, yes. I, I record my, um, my interstitials between the songs. I record that on Audacity. On Aud on Audacity, I can't even speak. <laughs> I know that's a <laughs> take two on Audacity, yeah. and uh, then I'll just use that little little bit with my speech, and I'll put it in where it belongs on the show. At the very end, uh, there's an export feature on Audacity where I can export it to, again, any one of a number of different files. Uh, WFDU accepts MP3, so that I usually go to MP3, 320 kilobits, but it can also go to different formats as well. Yeah. Um, Bruce is saying he uses an external Zoom recorder. So I've heard of those as well. So he's recording his segues externally and then importing them just like a song, I guess. Yeah, I, I, you can yeah. do that. I mean, again, there's no real set way of doing any of this. I just what I basically do is I'll open up a second window in Audacity and I use that as my vocal recording. I'll record my piece. I'll save it as a file like I'll call it Trad 1 or Trad 2, whatever this segment is and then i'll just drag and drop it like i do a song nice wow okay you guys this has been a really awesome conversation i guess we knew it was going to be and i think most of our audience here are djs or um however i do know a couple singer songwriters out there who are lurking and really curious about the behind the scenes of the dj world and and that brings me to our um, dj peer sessions which we're hosting and these are not limited to midwest djs these are or nor are they limited to djs they're folk dj and friends peer group session <clears throat> excuse me the next one is happening on april 14th we're doing them every month um, and I will double check that, but if you go to farmvirtualconnections.org, you'll see the schedule over there. If you're new to Farm Virtual Connections, uh, we host Tuesday Tech Talks almost every week. And we are hoping, fingers crossed, that next week's Tech Talk will be on Bandcamp, which is, uh, I'd be very curious to know what the DJs, <laughs> but we'll, we'll leave it there. I think this could probably last a whole nother hour with all the... Uh, <laughs> stuff that's out there um but we also have a community peer group session at which of course you djs are all welcome um that's everybody from the uh, folk music community or our community at large um that is happening on thursday this is our bi-weekly peer group session so that's thursday at 2 p.m everything is eastern time so keep that in mind and we've got mentor sessions coming up in april so lots happening here at farm virtual connections um and we are always grateful to our beautiful audience and people who drop in to see us these are being broadcast on facebook and youtube and you can go out and watch them again we'll also have links on our website so that you can watch the broadcast this was so full of info ron Thank you so, so much. We're going to go into gallery view right now so that everybody can wiggle their hands at you and say how. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> this was a lot of fun. I really this enjoyed it. I hope I gave some information. And anybody wants to reach me, my, my email address is ron at folkmusicnotebook.com. And I'll be happy to answer any other questions or give I'm some extra put, guidance. <laughs> I'm going to put that in here, Ron, at Folk Music Notebook. I've also put the other links in here. Um, I can tell you, if you want to save the chat, there's three little dots in the lower right corner of the chat window next to, you know, where you address it. And it, you should be you should be able to save the chat, which will post some links, but I will also email them to you um, after the fact. So thank you all so much, and uh, we'll see you again next time. Thank hey, you. Have a great day. Thanks, Ron. Thank you. Bye-bye.